Um, but just to go through our um, uh, harassment policy and everything again, uh, please treat everyone here with respect. This is a safe space and a um, you know, fertile ground for um, intellectual discussion. So no need to be nasty, just um, uh, keep going with the same kind of tone we've had this morning, actually. Um, helpful, constructive, happy, friendly. Um, if there are any issues, then please do um, message me privately or message Tess, who is our sort of shadow chair, um, taking care of everything Zoom side, um, either through the private chat function on Zoom or via the LPFG email account, which I will be keeping half an eye on while also chairing this afternoon's sessions. I'm sure you all saw what the sessions are going to be this afternoon, um, but as you can see, it's going to be good. Um, a lot of really good um, new ways of looking at materials, new um, approaches to later prehistoric materials. Um, so if I stop sharing there. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming back. And may I introduce our first speaker, Reb Ellis. Um, Reb has just finished uh, her PhD on animals and Latin art at Hull, which will um, earlier this year and it will be out next year with Archeopress. So keep an eye out for that because I definitely am because from what I've seen you share on Twitter, it's going to be great. No um, pressure, no pressure. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be watching with great interest. Um, and um, otherwise, Reb is currently working on early career fellowship applications and um, you put into your bio, God forbid, Roman ceramics, which I understand the apprehension. <laughs> <laughs> yes, backup training. I'm going into Iron Age ceramics as well, but start with the Rome. Absolutely. Yeah, you need, to, you need an in. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you able to share your screen? I you um, go. Can everybody see that? We can. Brilliant. Fantastic. Right, well, thank you very much. So, the Marlborough Bucket is arguably the second most decorated vessel of its kind in Iron Age Europe. And since its discovery in the late 19th century, there have been many questions about its four horse and six human characters, its origins, its dating. Um, but as researchers, we have been really hampered by the little publicly available imagery. And this is now no longer the case. So this talk is going to introduce to you the concept of photo stacking or focus stacking as a means of recording complex small finds and artifacts. And we'll give you an idea of the kinds of questions we've been able to answer about this enigmatic masterpiece with this brand new analysis. Now discovered by laborers whilst digging for uh, gravel, this book, it was originally discovered in 1807. It's reported that the vessel contained cremated remains, but none of the deposit, any related artifacts or any other evidence that this was part of a larger cemetery survives. And what we know of its discovery in early life is hardly straightforward. A local reverend, Mr. Francis, realized its importance when it was uncovered and employed a Mr. Suck of Marlborough to draw the vessel at one to three inch scale whilst it was in situ before it inevitably collapsed. Later in 1812, new images were commissioned, this time to be done by a Mr. Croker, and they are the watercolours that you see here. Now, these were apparently based on both the bits of the bucket that had been recovered and those original one to three inch scale sketches. However, at some point after this, the pieces of the bucket ended up within the collection of the noted antiquarian Sir Colt Hoare somewhere in Salisbury and they were actually rediscovered by accident in a cupboard 80 years later. It was finally analysed and written up by Cunnington in 1887, and you can find that on the open access issues of the Wiltshire Archaeology and Natural History magazine online. By this point, however, those original one in three inch sketches that were originally done by Mr Tuck were lost. So these images here of 1812 are the earliest images we have of the bucket and have been used for subsequent reconstructions. Now the bucket is constructed of either oak or yew, not really sure, and they are, it is secured by iron coopering bands. And between these bands are the highly decorated copper alloy sheets decorated in the repousse style. Now the bucket is unusual for being so large, in some respects calling it a vat might be a little bit more appropriate. 
then to put it into context, other buckets such as Baldock, Alcum, Aylesford, they're about 12 litres in capacity. The Marlborough bucket is 100 litres. It's insane. Why is it noteworthy? Well, one, it's the only artwork in the UK to show multiple different types of horses decorating the same artefact outside of three types of coinage. It's also generally the most figuratively decorated piece in the UK, full stop. It's also the best example of horse depictions outside of coinage. Other examples of horses in the period, the Silchester horse being the only example, are actually pretty cruddy in comparison. This idea of horses being the symbol of kings is not so straightforward. And thirdly, it is the second most decorated vessel of its kind in Europe, second only to the Gunderstrup cauldron, which is a headache in its own right. Now, there are a number of research questions that I started with with the Marlborough bucket, and I like to keep them into these three main areas. First of all, we have little doubt that this is a product of the first century BC, uh, but this is a highly complex time in Iron Age archaeology, particularly in southern Britain. Can we narrow down this date any further? Other buckets, such as Lenham and Baldock, show multiple repairs. They had a really complex and in some cases heavy life before they became part of a grave cache. Is there evidence for this kind of biography for the Marlborough bucket? And also, when it did become part of the grave cache, I ask, have to ask, did this hold a single cremation or potentially multiple? And then we have to talk about the imagery. Why four different types of horse on one object? What is the significance of difference? Why six human characters? And what's the significance of the twins and repeats? This is ongoing. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the horses today. And does this imagery, uh, does the style of imagery suggest that it is of a British manufacturer or something that has continental inspiration? So with this in mind, I did my first 600 mile round trip to visit the Marlborough Bucket back in May 2021. I soon realised that the only way to study this effectively was to make a brand new photographic record of it. So back in February this year, that's exactly what myself and my partner Mike Haken went and did. And can I just say here, thanks so much again to Lisa and Dave for this wonderful, wonderful privilege and their generosity in time and patience with us. This was a baptism of fire when it comes to artifact recording. Now, for the sake of everybody's blood pressure and given the delicacy of the thinness of the copper alloy, there is no way in hell we were taking the bits of the bucket off its current home and putting them in a studio to photograph. So instead, we did an in-display shoot to ensure safety, to ensure preservation and to keep a healthy distance. This then meant that we did an awful lot of digital post editing, which could be done back at home. So it actually made life quite a bit easier. Now, we use a technique called focus or photo stacking, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a moment. And then digitally edited, well, digitally stitched and edited the photographs in Serif Affinity Photo. This is a much more affordable piece of software when you don't have a departmental budget to play with um, compared to its Adobe competitor and quite honestly gives equally as good results. So I'm going to explain to you how photo stacking works and to do that I really needed a bit more of a 3D object. This is a newly discovered anthropomorphic sword hilt pommel which is currently on the prehistoric gallery at the Corinian Museum. Many thanks to James Harris for facilitating my visit earlier this summer. This is about three centimetres deep, um, so it gives a bit more depth to work with. And this, uh, more information, a write up about this and a couple of other bits will be coming out soon. But if you want to ask questions later, please, by all means, feel free. In this explanation, you're going to have to imagine that we're watching the process of photography from the side whilst the camera lens is pointing at the face of the object. Now, photo stacking or focus stacking is not new in photography. It was mainly developed for macro photography, that of photographing small subjects such as flowers, but you can actually also use it to capture landscapes. Macro lenses that you used for this kind of photography and that we also like to use when photographing small finds have what is called a shallow depth of field. This means that when the lens is focused, for instance, at the front of the object, it cannot always get the detail further back in focus at the same time. So when you take a single photo, only part of the object is in focus, which is pretty useless for us for a record shot. So the way to deal with this is to take multiple photographs which focus on different points of the object. Now, theoretically, I could take a photo that focuses on the front of the object, that focuses on the middle detail, and then focuses on the detail that's furthest away. I could then download these, pop them into the software, 
which searches all the bits that are in focus and stitches it all together for me. And this is focus stacking in its simplest form. Now, as I said earlier, macro lenses um, can only focus on a really small part. And the smaller the object, the more powerful lens you have to use. Sometimes they can only focus on a millimeter's depth. And so taking three photos is not going to allow you to capture all the detail you want. So in the case of this and in the case of some of the plates for the Marlboro bucket, we were taking between 30 and 80 photos at a time, stitching them all together to get the detail that you need. Now, a camera like the Nikon D780, there are plenty of other cameras coming out with this capability now, have a program built in called Focus Shift Shooting. In this instance, we told the camera to take um, a photo moving only one focus width step width per photo, so the smallest change in focus it could make. And all you have to do is make sure then that you tell it to take enough images to cover the back, the front to the back of the photo to get the whole depth. Um, to cover the whole depth of field. Now it tends to mean that you are taking longer to take these images as you need to check results every time. So after you download and the, and the software does its magic to see if you've got everything right, it takes five to 10 minutes per shot. It's labor of love, but it gets the results. So what did all this new imagery do for us? Well, here's a snapshot of some of the results. I'm gonna start at the top of the bucket and work our way down. So firstly, it's long been assumed that the decorative plates of the stave, which are these upright bits here, are the same long haired character. Now, photography, analysis of the x-rays and new analysis has finally been able to demonstrate that this is not the case. The hairstyles are distinctly different. Here on the left, we have six bunches of hair which clearly terminate at the nape of the neck. This is a loose curled hairstyle that's being shown on a sidewards profile. And what's interesting about this hairstyle is that you can see it on an anthropomorphic sword hilt from the Czech Republic of the first century BC. And it's a borrowed Roman style. This is not, if you like, a, excuse the phrase, native style at all. This is an introduction. And the great thing about it is that it's relatively well dated, specifically to the middle of the first century BC. So already in our first image, we have a brand new dating marker. Now, on the right, you can see that the bunches of hair clearly terminate at the middle of the head rather than down at the nape. And the hairstyle are finished with a long flowing end. And you can see just the remains of it here. Now, when you have a look at similar hairstyles where there's a full body to get an idea of gender on statuary in France and also on earlier coinage, this tends to be a hairstyle associated with female forms. And that's immediately a really interesting point because often in Iron Age imagery we are plagued with an overrepresentation of male forms. And so to have the first two decorative pieces on this bucket show an element of gender equality and representation is a really new interesting theme and something I'm going to be coming back to. Now the last thing I want to mention about this right hand panel is actually it's poor execution and it's relatively tatty state. Here you can see the stave hole is really roughly cut. It's really close to the nose. It's nowhere near as smooth as this side over here. You can also see here as some overlapping pieces of copper alloy that we don't see anywhere else on the bucket. And you'll remember me telling you earlier about those buckets that show evidence of repair in their lives before becoming part of a grave cache. I, sus I really suspect this is a replacement plate, a contemporary Iron Age re replacement plate and more work needs to be done on this. But again, we could be looking here at object biography. So already in the first two images, we have a brand new dating marker, evidence of gender equality or questioning of uh, gender representation in art, and potentially, um, well, just so many questions. There's so many, I can't even keep count of them all. There are also some longstanding mysteries which were to be solved, and thankfully we managed to answer a few of them. So the original Croker watercolours of 1812, instead of pet horse pere, which stands there now, showed this slightly strange upside down winged Nike figure almost. And it soon transpired, we realised that Croker, when he did his watercolours, actually drew horse pet A upside down. Now, considering he based these drawings on those by Mr. Tuck, who apparently took his sketches from the in situ item, we have to ask how this mistake occurred. Did the bucket collapse before this bit could be finished? Oh, without a TARDIS, we're never going to really be sure. 
And it does have to mean that we have to ask whether this counts casts doubt on the order and makeup of the other elements of the bucket. Now, well, to be honest, I found no other major discrepancies between the watercolours and the surviving pieces that cannot be accounted for through the conservation works that happened in the 80s. Therefore, I'm not willing to throw these watercolours out as a piece of source material so quickly. Now, we're going to move on to band two and the best surviving full frontal portrait, which is here of a male subject. And you can see how silvery and bright his eyes are. It was confirmed in the 1980s through XRF that this isn't just some random thing. This is actually the use of tin to make the whites of the eyes shine. However, conservators didn't just find this tinning on the front, but they also found evidence of the tinning on the back of the piece that you would never see, specifically across the two eyelids. What does this mean? What could this represent? Well, when they found a very similar phenomenon on the analysis of the Gunstruck Cauldron in 2005 and later confirmed in 2009, Nielsen and their colleagues postulated that a tin paste or putty had been used as a means by which to affix the glass eyes into place. It appears as though a similar technique has been used here. Colour-wise, we can only speculate. Gunstruck Cauldron had very rare purple glass for the eyes. In Britain, we could be looking at a red or blue, but there's no real way to say for any certainty. Band 2 also provides us more tantalising clues regarding that equality in re gender representation. On the right, we have the other surviving profile, and this was rightly identified by E.M. Joke to be a bobbed haired female figure, the closest parallel of which you can find on the Rinkeby Cauldron in Denmark, also dating to the first century BC. Is it a coincidence, given the stave, that here we have another equal male and female form? I'm not sure it is. And I'm starting to think, again, this is really going to force us to question uh, human representation in Iron Age art in Britain in the first century BC. There's something a little bit more complex going on here. Now, on to horses. There are two styles of horse on band two, BA and BB. They overall have the same rough outline, but BA has much more uh, decoration and detail. Excuse me a moment. Now... The first thing to note is that we do not have Arab style horses in the period at all in Britain. So this tale is immediately a conscious design choice. The horses we have are much more akin to modern Dale or fell ponies. So this tale, to somebody who's worked with horses throughout through a little bit of their lives, um, this tale appears to be shaved. This is a man-made adjustment to the horse appearance, and I don't think it's something just for the art. The shaving, and I hate to say it, the docking of horse's tail was actually commonplace practice in pre-industrial 19th and 20th century farming. It was so that the hair from the tail did not get caught in farm machinery. It was essentially a health and safety practice. Horse hair we also know is extremely useful, and there is evidence that it can be spun into yarns and bl when, when blended with other fibres, though we have no strict evidence for this in the Iron Age. And you can actually still see the practice of shaving or trimming a horse's tail um, in modern Am Amish communities. Now, my point about this is that the shaving of the tail here could indicate that the horses portrayed are practical working horses. And this can happen in two scenarios. They could either be used for economic purposes, such as on the farm. This could also be something that is a change made for those pulling chariots. I have no way to prove it here. But it's something really important to consider when looking at horse imagery in general. There's quite a lot of variety in tail and it could be quite important. Now, the appendage under the chin here is a little le less obvious and it's important, might not even be important at all. To me, it looks like a representation of the beard and moustaches that you get when a horse is overwintered. It gets grazed off in the summer. Um, we can't be sure. There's not enough detail. We don't have enough evidence. And finally, we have a really nice use of latent swirls, either to portray musculature or potentially to portray other decoration of the horse body. We know from records that, um, you know, humans painted in blue woad, did they do the same for their horses? But something else came up when I was digitally tidying up this image, and I want to go back with RTI to have a look at this. When I emailed David about it, he went down and checked, you can see this with the naked eye. We just didn't notice at the time. There is a really faint but distinct diamond shaped pattern with something that looks awfully triskel like in the center on the flank of this horse. Is this the first evidence we have for horse branding or horse decoration in a slightly different way? It, 
I'm yet to go back and deal with that. <laughs> There's still so much more to do. In some ways, these images brought about way more questions than they did answers. Now, the third style of horse I want to show you, which is very important, is horse pair style, horse pair C, and this is on the bottom band of the bucket. This, uh, I've flipped the x-ray so both images are correct. This, and it's a stitch of two images. Now, the first thing to point out are these really long lead rein like tongues. You don't tend to see them in the wide art of Britain at all. You may say it in two cases of coinage, but the dies aren't consistent. However, where you unequivocally and characteristically see it is in the Paris Basin. If you look at the gold status of Parisi coinage, this is their absolute character characterized style of portraying a horse. This, along with some of the other human imagery, is what leads me very much to believe that the motifs on this bucket are not just solely for a British audience at all, but a European one. But the other thing I really wanted to point out is the stippling here. And you also have slightly uh, more faded, um, slightly less well-preserved texturing going on back here. Now, when this bucket was brand new, this would have really glinted in the firelight as a texture. And this texturing may well have been used to separate, and if you like, tableau different motifs. You can also see it behind horse pair A. You can't see it anymore with the naked eye. Now, this is really important because whenever anybody is crazy enough to try and recreate this bucket, either literally or digitally, it's important details like this, which will have to be included to give it its overall effect. And it's also the first time we've seen this technique used potentially for this purpose. Now, these are not scale because if they were, they wouldn't be detailed enough, but this just gives you an idea of the richness of the imagery. And so what on earth does all of this mean? Why is this imagery significant? Well, for me, the clue is in the equal representation of at least four different types of horse. I say at least four because actually there is a fragment of an ear which also survives, but it is not diagnostic. All of these horses are given their own equal space. Now we know from buckets like Aylesford and Lenham that artists are more than capable of depicting interacting and even conflicting imagery. So this seems to be a very purposeful choice occurring here. What can horses represent? Well, like I explained with Parisi coinage, often horses, different horses on different coinage are often representative of different polities. And they're used very differently from horses in wider art where there are no actual strict patterns at all in the UK. So if we hypothesize that each of these different styles of horse is purposely different because they represent a different polity, then we have to ask why they're given such equality. Is this representation a show of unity and understanding? And what on earth could cause this said show of unity and understanding? What could show uh, several groups wanting to display this? Because this was undoubtedly an object of display first and foremost. Well, given the mid first century BC dating marker, thanks to our pair of males up here, the only logical answer that I can come up with, which involves groups on both sides of the channel, is the Gallic Wars of 58 to 52 BC. And Caesar's political expansion, the bloodshed and the revolt that changed the political landscape of Gaul and Britain. This was a short snapshot into new work, and you can see a longer talk for free on the Devizes Museum YouTube channel. And also, I'm very pleased to say, in this month's British Archaeology magazine. And finally, the imagery you have seen here will become open access for non-commercial academic purposes. It will be out soon. So thank you very much. Wow, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. For, um, beautiful start to the afternoon. And absolutely, I'll be looking up the um, full talk uh, that you link there. Um, Ooh, already getting um, questions in. I just wanted to start off quickly with um, kind of the technique that you were using, the photo stacking, sounds brilliant. Um, and I was just wondering, the program you used to stitch it together, the files that you end up with, are they sort of particularly large? Does this sort of cause any issues for sort of publishing and dissemination? Yes and no. It depends how many photo. Every photo we take is the highest quality the camera can take. Right. Um, and when you stitch together, it depends how many. It also depends uh, the size of export you dictate. So I can export lower quality JPEGs and they can single ones can be placed in email attachment. That's fine. But right. the minute you change it to a publication quality 300 or 600 DPI, 
that's when your file size starts to increase. Right. It's easily rectified on a wee transfer link. When it comes to actually stitching the photographs together, um, I mean, the laptop we use, is it an i3 or an i5 processor? Mm, Other half's not listening. It's I7, oh, it's an i7. <laughs> I mean, that does it really well. But, you know, some, nothing shorter than an i5, but you don't need ridiculous processing power to actually achieve what we achieve. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Um, we are getting some uh, comments and questions into the chat. Um, people finding um, comparisons for the um, shortened horse tails. Fascinating about um, horse tail docking. I've never heard of it in them. Um, yeah, the, it's before. it's it's really barbaric. Um, yeah, shaving much more, um, which is you know the kind of side I try and focus on. Yeah, you can see it on Gallo Belgic status of the second century BC. You can see it on a couple of different other horse styles. Um, yeah. British coinage tend to be slightly longer tails. Um, in terms of art, we have very few full horse figurines from England and Wales in particular. There's a legged figurine in Worcester that has a short tail, but the Silchester horse uh, model is a very long tail. So it's an area I need to look into more. The significance is something that's been very easily missed. I look forward to hearing about it. Um, Ed says, hi, Reb, awesome talk and amazing imagery. Absolutely. Thank if you've you. taken pictures of the cauldron from lots of views, could you try making a 3D model of the cauldron using photogrammetry? Oh, God. OK. So... <laughs> It's on the to-do list. I have to explain, this was our first, myself and my other half, Mike Taking's first attempt at doing something on this scale. It was a mm. week of a baptism of fire. I'm doing it a lot more now independently. We're getting there with it, but I personally feel that it's easy to see all the imagery out in a single line. Um, we are thinking about it. <laughs> also, just to let you know, we're based in North Yorkshire. It's, it's 300 miles away in Devizes. It's quite <laughs> difficult for us to cover. <laughs> That there's lots of different things we still want to do, but baby steps. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, Andrew Fitzpatrick asks, how reliable is the dating of the check, check find from Stair H? Hopefully not based on the argument that naturalist representations have to be Roman. Okay. Um, that I, I bow to the Magor and Magor reference that I suggested earlier. However, there are a couple of other bits of statuary that are coming out. Again, it's, it's relatively okay. We don't get this style in Britain from the little bit of work I've done. We tend to get the slightly later loose fringed version and all the material is still about that date. So we're doing the best we can with the evidence we have. Um, yeah, we do get an introduction of greater naturalism, but this is where you get that interlocking phase of Latin Roman. And you just, yeah, we have to be a little bit careful about how we describe it but it's mm -hmm. still relevant to what we're looking at. You could argue that a lot of the Marlborough bucket is naturalistic, but you can still see naturalistic um, depictions on stuff even from the second century BC in Europe. Naturalism cool. is not a very good or reliable marker for British material. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Meredith asks on the docking issue, do the few horse burials we have, brackets Poplington, have their tails? I don't know. That's something I want to look into. It's something that I couldn't go into in the PhD because of time and size constraints, more specifically. I think we could all uh, Hence, I have to draw humans officially, um, which was <laughs> sad that I had to. Um, but that is something that, again, needs to be picked up on and trying to match this kind of um, detail. Absolutely. Humans and horses should just stop appearing so often together. <laughs> Yeah. Take everything you do. <laughs> Why telling the archaeological record that? Um, yeah, I mean, but th this is why this is so important. It's so unique. You don't see this level of detail and multiple imagery in one item. And it's mm. slept quite soundly in the gallery at Devizes for slightly too long. Not, not any yeah. longer. I mean, I think you demonstrated that pretty well in the talk. Just fascinating things every um, slide. Um, Alan says we could do an entire conference on later prehistoric horses. I'll keep that one in the back pocket. <laughs> yes. <No. laughs> uh, in that case, um, don't seem to be any more specifically questions, but I recommend um, uh, scrolling through chat to be a lovely ego boost. Um, yes. 